This is part three of fixing my homemade helicopter and later on in the video I'll update you on the flying boat project. Thanks for all the great comments in the last video it was super to have so much input from viewers and it really helped discussing what turned out to be a divisive subject. The discussion was about using chains instead of a belt drive and there was concern about the added danger of using chains should they break. You are of course right, there would be much more potential for damage to the machine and myself should that happen. My thoughts were really to try and design a chain drive that would never break and so that risk wouldn't be of too much concern. There are parts on commercial helicopters that if they were to break you would fall from the sky and there would be no hope of any landing. The main rotor shaft separating for example. We don't worry about these critical parts breaking because they have been designed and tested thoroughly. They also get replaced well within the fatigue life of the parts, so the risk that such parts breaking is extremely small. If a chain drive was designed correctly, it too could be relied upon to never fail, but this is the hard bit here. A comment I had revealed some things which had to be investigated. If we take the calculated chain tension on the helicopter of 404 pounds and take the ultimate tensile strength of the chain at 9,220 pounds, it is only 4.4% of the maximum load the chain can take. A very healthy factor of safety of over 20 times stronger. Taking the Fireblade example, its maximum chain load of 2,561 pounds using the same chain is only a factor of safety of 4 or 25%. I find it hard then to understand given these numbers why a chain is going to break. However, the same comment pointed out to me that there is something called chain cordal effect. I hadn't heard of this and set about trying to understand what it was. This is a great animation of what's going on. We can see that as the sprocket rotates, the chain is moving up and down, as if the sprocket was getting bigger and smaller. This is making the chain go slack and tight, slack and tight in a cyclic fashion. This means the chain speed will be oscillating and causing vibration. It happens because there are hinges on a chain. A small sprocket has a small number of hinges to divide the circumference. As we increase the amount of teeth on a sprocket, there are more hinges to divide the circumference. That's why it's called the chordal effect because each chain pitch link divides the cord by larger fractions as the size of the sprocket decreases, increasing this slack tight scenario. I need to use an 8 tooth drive sprocket but this is way too small for smooth running. The caudal effect starts from around 17 teeth and lower. Looking at the Honda Fireblade chain and sprockets, the driving sprocket is 16 teeth. Coincidence? I think not. Another potential problem that was also pointed out to me in comments was chains don't like running on their side. I can understand how the weight of the chain would wear the sides of the teeth in this situation. Perhaps this could be avoided by having some supporting guides, but it's another problem in addition to the caudal effect. The third potential problem I could face with chain is the double reversal on the bottom chain causing too much heat. One of the reasons I was considering a chain drive was because it had already been done on the Benson B9 coaxial helicopter. The only difference was the rotor reversing was done by a differential gearbox. The drawings say the very large driven sprockets were 112 teeth. The engine RPM was 5400 and the rotor RPM was 330, making this ratio 16 to 1. That would mean the driven sprocket had to be 7 teeth. That's assuming the differential gearbox wasn't also a reduction drive. If it was, then my figures are wrong. It has been suggested to me that if I had another reduction, that would solve a few problems with the belt drive. Up to now, I didn't entertain this option because the suggestion was to have a reduction on the engine. A reduction on the engine would increase the torque on the dry shaft and increase torque on the tilting mast hinges. It would also have to be some sort of planetary or coaxial gearbox arrangement as moving the engine to accommodate a side-by-side -side reduction isn't really an option. If a planetary reduction gearbox could be installed on the tilting head and not on the engine, then the torque on the drive shaft and tilting head hinges would remain the same. A planetary gearbox could possibly do the rotor reversing. That would be better than the lower belt doing its double reversal. 
I could then increase the size of the driven sprockets, getting rid of the caudal effect problem with chains. Or continue with the belts at a more favourable driven pulley size. The downside would be the extra weight, not just the weight of the gearbox itself, but the gearbox weight would have to be counterbalanced on the front of the tilting head. So that would be the same as adding the weight of two gearboxes. Still an option, but adding a gearbox has also added complexity. I would certainly prefer to keep things as simple as possible, and that is why I chose to do the reduction and rotor reversing in one stage. Here is another option. This is the SCH-2A Murocopter made in Slovenia. They have done the reduction and rotor reversing in one hit and have also used belts. The belts I've been told are Moti-Rib PK transmission belts. They are not double sided and one belt actually runs on the back side of the belt around the large pulley. I suppose there is so much contact area on the large pulleys that it doesn't matter. They have used idler pulleys to increase the contact area on the driven pulley and to do the rotor reversing. The reason I did the rotor reversing on the driven pulleys and not the driving pulley was to keep the tilting head weight nearer the hinge. So that would be the downside with this route in my case. I had a few comments suggesting to replace my belt drive with a gearbox. I have never designed and built a gearbox before and I would love that challenge. This definitely is worth thinking about, at least get into the stage of a weight and cost prediction. For now though, I've decided to persist with the chosen synchronous belt drive. As I now believe the teeth aren't bent after the drive failure and aren't worn, then I'm happy to continue using this pulley. The only concern was that I'm running a slightly smaller than advised drive pulley. I'll try and find out from Gates whether using a pulley with two less teeth than advised is acceptable, without telling them what it's really for. As long as it's not a flying machine, I don't think there's any problem with them advising me. Perhaps I'll tell them it's for a well tower build. That's going to be a similar scenario, but a well tower shouldn't really leave the ground. I think it's about time I stopped yabbering on and actually did some engineering, don't you? This is the one way or clutch needle roller bearings I want to use, mentioned a couple videos ago. What I need to do is test the torque they can transmit. It's only a press fit. The data shows that one clutch bearing can transmit a maximum of 48 pounds feet. But that is a press fit into steel, not aluminium like I'm using. I've made a similar size test collar in order to press in the bearing and test the torque. The interference fit I've chosen for all the press fitted parts is 0.02 of a millimeter. I was worried that too much of an interference fit and the inner ring wouldn't slide into the bearing, not enough and it won't transmit the torque. Let's test it. There is no problem with using aluminium as this test demonstrates at 50 pounds feet. Maximum engine torque is 55 pounds feet, so I wouldn't be surprised if one bearing is enough to do the job, but I'm going to fit five of these. What is nice about doing this test is I have the measurements made with my measuring tools. All I have to do is replicate the sizes using the same measuring tools and I know it will be right. Before going further, I need to work out how this is all going to be assembled. No good making something that is impossible to assemble, and this took some thinking about. The first part will be the drive spindle with machined universal joint all in one piece. I need to make this soon. The next part will be the bearing housing, and here is the first problem. The bearing measures 20.01 millimeters, but the shaft it needs to slide over has to be 20.08 millimeters. This nearly stopped this whole idea, but... I have a cunning plan to solve the problem. Next will be the thrust bearing, then the belt guide and the pressed hardened steel collars, then the pulley and the top belt guide, followed by another thrust bearing and the top bearing and retaining bolt. 
The belts obviously need to be slid over the pulleys at some point during this assembly. Not the simplest of assemblies, but doable. The universal joint pulley drive shaft is the next part to make and I'm going to 3D print this part in ABS plastic to make sure it's nice and strong. As a millennial engineer, I can only make things from plastic using a computer and I think metal is for dinosaurs. Update on the C Crano flyer now and I'm making the cable pulleys. After my last joke, I'm actually making these from acetal plastic. The diameter of the pulley is chosen based on the cable size. Too small and the cable will fatigue and break. I'm using 2.5mm 7x19 stainless cables. These aren't aircraft certified cables. Cables that are certified are 10 times the price. What I've done is use two cables instead of one for redundancy. To break two control cables, I would have to pull on the control stick with at least a force of 241 kilograms. I demonstrated in the last video a 20 kilogram stick pull and I needed two hands to do that. Typically, microlike stick forces will never exceed 5 kilograms, even under extreme g-forces. I would say the cables I've chosen are vastly over-engineered, which more than compensates for the lack of certification. A little problem I've come across is making sure that the retracting cable moves the same distance as the pulling cable. If these aren't kept the same, then the system will bind up or the cables will go slack as you move the control surface. The rudder mechanism is something that had to be figured out by trial and error. The connecting rods are not parallel like I expected, but for some reason this seems to give the same pull and retract movement for the cables. A similar issue will probably be the case with the elevator as the hinge isn't currently in line with the wooden control horn, nor is it perpendicular to the control surface. But the system is starting to operate smoothly and early indications suggest control friction with all the pulleys is going to be perfectly acceptable. A big thank you goes to James Greenberger for all his assistance on the Secrano flyer, name to be confirmed. I've had a lot of contact with him and if you haven't seen his channel yet then there are some really inspiring flight and build videos all about his fantastic mud skipper.